So I finally managed to get my hands on a single 3090 Ti graphics card, but since it only kind of came in yesterday afternoon, uh, I didn't really have enough time to test it completely just yet. But luckily, uh, a lot of reviews are already out and most of the relevant data and the relevant information about the chip itself is already well known. So I can actually just focus on this particular model uh, today. So the Ti is supposed to be up to 10% faster than the 3090. Uh, it doesn't really offer good value at all and you can kind of throw the power efficiency out of the window because these cards are extremely power hungry uh, trying to squeeze out every last bit of performance possible. Now the model that I have right here is this pretty insane looking uh, Asus ROG Strix OC edition that is liquid cooled. So let's see how it performs and if it's worth checking out at all. Let's go! This video is brought to you by Seasonic and their Prime Series power supplies. These top quality power supplies are very efficient, they're whisper quiet, extremely reliable and my go-to choice for most of my test rigs and builds around here. And to make the deal even sweeter, Seasonic wraps it all up in a cozy 12 year long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. So the RTX 3090 Ti is Nvidia's new flagship graphics card uh, that uses the same GPU die as the 3090, but now it is actually fully unlocked. So it has a couple of cores more and it offers higher clock speeds and faster memory as well. Now, since the 3090 was the fastest GPU you could buy, until now, uh, this TI version takes that crown. It is on average up to 10% faster than the 3090 and that also puts it about 15 to 20% ahead of the 3080 and the 6900 XT. And this is a substantial performance improvement. So before adding things like, uh, like ray tracing and DLSS that also kind of put Nvidia a step ahead. Uh, this is all at 4K of course, because at low resolutions, this card doesn't make much sense at all. It does have 24 gigabytes of VRAM, so while lots of VRAM can be a good reason to buy a high-end card for uh, those certain professional workflows, remember that the 3090 non-TI has that too. Now, one of the biggest downsides is obviously the price. Now, the base MSRP is around $2,000 or 2250 euros in Europe, but a fancy third-party card like this one will cost you a couple of hundreds more. Now, ASUS couldn't really tell me the exact price of this model, but they said that it should be around 2400 euros here in the Netherlands, and that is a lot of money. Now, the GPU prices have been dropping recently, luckily, and right now you can actually buy an MSI RTX 3090 Supreme for around 1900 euros, so you should expect to pay a huge price premium for an equally high-end TI model. Now you get up to 10% of a performance increase for a 20 to 25% price increase, though the big factor here should be the fact that the 4000 series is just around the corner. But let's take a look at this ROG card. It is a pretty chunky card. Now the main unit that holds a single blower style fan is almost 30 centimeters long and about three slots thick. And it also has this 240 millimeter radiator that is connected to it. Now the build quality seems excellent with a really well made uh, backplate and what looks like to be an acetic pump radiator setup. Now the design choice to separate this radiator has its upsides but also its downsides. So your case needs to have a spot for this 240 millimeter radiator and you do have to kind of route these tubes somewhere. Now fan and RGB cables aren't much of an issue as they're already connected to the GPU but having this external radiator does get all of the heat from your GPU directly out of your case easily. And since these 3090 Ti's use close to 500 watts, this will make your whole system easier to cool down than having a typical air cooler on your card and relying on your case fans. Now, as usual, RGB is a big part of the design uh, with nice RGB fans on the radiator as well as a big RGB area on the front of the card. Uh, there's a logo on the side as well, but 
Considering the fact that most of the RGB is actually on the front, I think they really made this card with vertical mounting in mind. And from that angle, it is a great looking GPU. There's a fan profile switch on the top and there are two extra four pin fan headers uh, on the side, which you can use to connect your case fans to. So they can kind of adjust their speed based on your GPU temps. Now, my favorite part of the design is that power connector on top. Having a single 12 pin cable is so much nicer to cable manage than having three thick 8-pin connectors. Now, ASUS is including a splitter for anyone with an older power supply, uh, but that splitter is not as pretty, so I kind of strongly recommend that you ask the manufacturer of your own power supply for a specific cable. So I was using a 1300 watt Sezonic Prime unit here, and Sezonic does ship this special cable to anyone who bought a GPU with this connection, uh, which I think is really cool, but I also believe that Corsair and others are doing it too, so make sure that you check whichever brand you have. Now on the back, uh, you get three DisplayPort 1.4 connections and two HDMI 2.1 connections. So a reference 3090 Ti is supposed to boost uh, to 1860 megahertz, and this card is supposed to go to 1950 to 1980 megahertz, uh, according to the specs ASUS provided, uh, because this is an OC card. But these specs are also kind of pointless for years now, and almost every card nowadays kind of boosts itself a bit higher than the spec, uh, depending on the temperatures, of course. So right now, uh, right out of the box, uh, this card boosts to around 2055 megahertz in the quiet BIOS and 2070 megahertz in the performance BIOS. So right away, uh, this card will offer a couple of percent more performance than a 3090 Ti that is running at reference clocks. Now, when looking at the thermal performance, uh, we can see that the only thing that sets these two BIOS profiles apart is the fan curve. Now, the power consumption is pretty much the same, but uh, the performance profile just runs the fans a little bit louder uh, that leads to a lower temperature, which then causes the GPU to boost itself a tiny bit higher. Now, those 54 degrees on the GPU and a hotspot of around 67 degrees are actually excellent results when you consider how much power power this card uses. Now, many high-end cards show hotspots in the 90s or even higher, or they just let the memory run very hot, while this card does not. But I do think that 45 decibels is pretty loud. Now, I really do get that they're going for performance here, but I kind of personally like uh, that my gaming rig is a bit quieter. Now, in quiet BIOS, it drops down to 43 decibels, which is noticeable, uh, but still pretty audible. And I would really like to have at least a quiet profile that is actually quiet. Now, since there are a lot of thermal headroom, I just did a quick test with an even lower fan speed. And when I kind of dropped the fans under 40 decibels, the thermal results were still excellent. Uh, the clock speeds did drop a tiny bit, but you can actually just manually up the core speed in the software by a bit to kind of make up for that. So I do think that the fan curve can use a little bit of tuning, but I also do think that this level of thermal performance does deserve some credit. Uh, they have done really well with overbuilding this card with a proper cold plate that kind of cools the chip as well as the memory, and they also didn't cheap out at all. Uh, if you're interested in a full teardown of this card, uh, Tech Power Up has a really good one, so I will leave a link in the description down below. Now, when it comes to overclocking, I usually don't spend that much time overclocking because it is very much so sample specific, but this is a card that has overclockers in mind uh, because it includes a little area on the PCB for voltage mods and for readouts. So I did try to push the card a bit further using the software and with a power limit on 107%, I found that it was game stable on 2190 megahertz, but it would start crashing at 2200 megahertz. Now the memory, when up to 1505 megahertz without any issues, which is actually a pretty big increase. Now, what that means in real world scenarios will depend on the game, uh, but let's say that you're looking at another five to 6% more and it didn't even impact the power consumption that much. Still, I would say that the power consumption remains 
the biggest issue of this 3090 Ti. Now the amount of extra power it uses to get that performance is just incredible. I mean, I get that this card is all about performance, but I think it would be irresponsible not to point out that in order to get that performance, you really shouldn't care about the concept of value, a concept of power efficiency, or even that bigger impact on gaming on a card that uses about 500 watts. Now I'm sure that if you can afford this card, you can also afford your power bill, uh, but with electricity now costing about 50 cents per kilowatt here in the Netherlands, it will probably be worth remembering that every long night that you spend gaming with this card will cost you a couple of euros in electricity, which adds up quite quickly. Now ASUS recommends using a 1000 watt power supply, which isn't unreasonable. Now a typical rig that is built around this card will probably use somewhere between 650 to 700 watts while gaming. Uh, my personal setup uh, was about 670 watts. But you do need to remember that these cards do tend to really spike sometimes, which will cause issues with many 850 watt power supplies. So a proper 1000 watt or even a 1300 watt unit, so that you kind of sit in that optimal efficiency zone, is something that you should definitely invest in if you're looking at a card like this one. Now, honestly, I think that most of what you need to know about the 3090 Ti has already been said at this point. So it is ridiculously expensive, it is incredibly power hungry to a point where it's pretty much irresponsible to run it at all. And I think that even if you want to game on 4K, it just makes so much more sense to look at something like a 3080 or even a 3080 Ti, especially so if the rumors are true and the 4000 series will be out later this year. But I also kind of know that some of you just don't care and you just want to buy whatever card is the bestest and the fastest at the moment, uh, no matter the cost or anything else for that matter. And there is no denying that the 3090 Ti is exactly that. So if you do decide to go that way and you're looking for a card that performs really well at the expense of a bit more noise, and if you cannot really wait to see what the 4000 series will bring, this ROG card does its job pretty well. Now that's all. Thank you so much for watching and see you guys in the next one. Bye.